So my name is Emery, and I'm going to be talking today about the kinds of inferences our common sense psychology can make by tracking the time it takes people to respond to questions. And specifically, I'll be talking about some work I've been doing looking at how that understanding of response time develops in childhood. And I'll start with a quick story about this guy because it pretty much summarizes what I'm going to talk about. This is John von Neumann, and he was famous for being able to do calculations very quickly in his head. So one day a colleague put a question to him, and there were two ways to answer this question. One way uses the formula for summing a geometric series, but it's pretty labor intensive and would take some time even for a mathematician. The other way is an insightful trick that makes the answer immediately obvious. And the question looks like this. Two cyclists, 20 miles apart, are moving towards each other at 10 miles an hour. A fly is caught between them, moving at 15 miles an hour from the wheel of one bike to the wheel of the other and back again until it's crushed between the wheels of the bikes. So the question is, how far will the fly travel? Von Neumann answered immediately, and his colleague was disappointed and said, oh, you've heard about the trick. And von Neumann answered, what trick? I simply summed the geometric series. So what does this illustrate? Well, first, we're surprised when people make complex inferences really fast, even if that person is a well-known genius. In other words, we think that thinking takes time, and the more complex the thing you're thinking about, the more time it will take. But second, we're not at all surprised if someone retrieves a memory really fast. And not only that, if someone gives us the correct answer to a complex problem really fast, we assume they must have already known the answer. And finally, if someone really does solve a complex problem extremely quickly, we take that as evidence of high competence. Or more specifically, if the person is accurate, then we take speed to signal competence. If they're not accurate, then it may not be as clear how to interpret a quick response to a complex problem. You might think the person is impulsive or maybe just clueless. But either way, it's helpful to know how competent the people around you are. So what do we know about timing-based inferences in children? A set of experiments presented at CogSci last year looked at children's ability to integrate time and difficulty when judging an agent's competence. So they showed four and five-year-olds, two agents at tables, building block towers. And when the agents built identical towers, but one agent finished faster, children thought the faster agent was better at building block towers. But children also consider outcomes. If one agent finishes their tower a little bit faster, but that tower is a lot shorter, then children think that the slower agent that built the taller tower is more competent. But if there aren't clear physical cues as to how difficult the task is, then the four and five-year-olds are at chance. And the thing is, tasks aren't always difficult because of physical effort. There's not even always a physical outcome. You might find it difficult to recall a name or a date or to solve a tricky math problem, and there you're not moving at all, and the only outcome is a verbal utterance. So there's no physical cues. So how do we recognize cognitive difficulty? Well, there's some evidence that even at 24 months, toddlers interpret speech disfluencies like um and uh as signaling processing difficulties, like when you struggle to remember a word. So in one study, experimenters showed the toddlers a familiar object and an unfamiliar object, and they measured children's predictive looking time. And when the speaker said, look at the, uh, before giving the label, children predictively looked at the novel object more than the familiar object. And one interpretation here is that speakers use filler words when they're struggling to remember something. And since you wouldn't expect someone to forget a word like ball, if the speaker is struggling to remember the word, they must be thinking about something else, like this weird green thing here on the right, the wug. So children's inferences here weren't exactly based on response latency, they were based on the filler words. But the experiment does suggest that children are making inferences about the cognitive processes that produce a response, at least implicitly. So in our experiments, we wanted to explore children's understanding of the latency of different cognitive processes and what other kinds of inferences they can make on that basis. So first, do kids think that memory is faster than figuring something out for the first time? Second, if they know that the person is working on a complex task for the first time, do they think uh, that answers that are implausibly fast are going to be wrong. And finally, if they know that the person is solving a complex task for the first time, 
but they find out afterwards that the person was accurate, do they think the person must be high competence or do they just think the person was lucky? So in the first study, we asked whether children recognize that memory for the solution to a complex problem can potentially be really fast, even if figuring that solution out for the first time would take time. And we came up with a pathfinding game and taught kids how to play. So let me show you how it worked. Mario here wants to collect all of the treasures on this map, and he wants to find the shortest road through the map. But there's a rule. He cannot collect two treasures in a row that are the same color or two in a row that are the same shape. But again, he has to collect all the treasures and he has to find the shortest road. And to make sure that kids understood the game, they went through a training procedure where they had to answer questions about each of the rules. And in one case, even explain how Mario was breaking a rule. And I won't go through the whole training process just because of time, but I'm happy to answer questions about it offline. The training included feedback to help ensure the kids understood the rules. And we repeated the rules several times during the training. And there were a few five and six year olds who failed the training and so they didn't participate in the main task. But most kids actually got the answers right on their first try. So we feel pretty confident that the children understood the rules. Now in the main task, we told participants that they were going to watch other people playing a game. And we said that each person would start their engine when they think they know the shortest road. But we said, some of the people played these maps yesterday. So they're remembering the shortest road from yesterday. Other people, we said, have never played these maps before, so they're figuring out the shortest road for the first time. And participants' job was just to say whether each person was figuring out the answer for the first time or remembering the answer from yesterday. So let me show you what a trial looked like. So we said, here's the next person. We'll load the map, and when he thinks he knows the shortest road that follows the rules, he'll start his engine. So there's the map. And now he's started his engine, so he thinks he knows the shortest road through the map. But do you think he was figuring out the shortest road for the first time, so yellow? Or do you think he was remembering the shortest road from yesterday, so blue? Each participant saw six trials like that, and for each trial, they just had to say whether the person was definitely remembering, probably remembering, probably figuring out, or definitely figuring out. And in three of the trials, the person took 20 seconds to respond. And in three of the trials, the person took three seconds to respond. And we presented those trials in four counterbalanced orders. Now, at the end of the experiment, we had one other task to ensure that participants recognized that solving these puzzles takes time. And for the second task, we introduced them to two characters who we said had never seen the maps before. But one of the characters liked to cheat he had special glasses that would show him the answer when he looked at a map. The other character, we said, always played fair. And participants' job was just to say who we showed the map to as a simple binary choice. So participants saw a single fast response trial. And so if they recognize that a map like this can't be solved in three seconds, then they should think that the cheater was the one starting his engine. And we tested 45 kids ages five to seven, another 45 kids ages 8 to 10, and 45 adults on MTurk. And I'll plot the average ratings on the y-axis with the definitely figuring it out as a 4 and definitely remembering as a 1. And I'll plot the ratings for fast trials in green box plots and slow trials in blue box plots. Now we predicted that kids of all ages would interpret fast responses as memory and slow responses as inference. And we also thought that recognizing fast responses as memory would develop earlier than slow responses. And the reason is that while three seconds is way too fast to solve puzzles like this for the first time, and so it can only be memory, slow responses are more ambiguous. You could be figuring it out for the first time, but you could also just be struggling to recall the answer. And what we found was that older children and adults strongly distinguished between the response speeds. They thought that fast responses were memory, and they thought that slow responses were inference, as we predicted. You can see the means there in the gray boxes, and although they both differ from chance, the older children didn't differ significantly from adults. And younger kids showed the same pattern. 
they were significantly more likely to rate the fast responses as memory and the slow responses as inference, as we predicted, and the ratings for both speeds differed significantly from chance. So it looks like children can use response speed to distinguish between memory and inference. But though there were some trends, we didn't actually find the earlier recognition that the fast response must have been memory. But we had a second task with the cheater. And for the cheater task, people just saw one fast response trial, and they then made a binary choice about whether the player had cheated or figured it out on their own. So I'll again plot age groups on the x-axis, but since it was a binary response, I'll just plot the percentage saying that the fast response must have been the cheater on the y-axis. And all age groups were significantly more likely than chance to say that the fast responder must have cheated, and that includes 80% of six-year-olds and 87% of seven-year-olds. And so we think together, these two tasks give us evidence that even as children, we recognize that figuring out complex problems takes time, but that remembering complex solutions doesn't necessarily take time. Memory can be fast, even for solutions that were hard to come by. And so next, we wanted to examine kids' interpretations of fast responses more closely. So there's no way that you could actually solve one of these maps in three seconds. And so we wanted to see whether kids would be more skeptical of fast responses than slow responses, even if they didn't actually categorize fast responses as memory earlier in development. So in the second experiment, we used the same design, but we just asked kids to predict whether the agents got the right answer. And we also had a second task at the end of this experiment where we looked at kids' judgments about the agent's competence when we told them afterwards that actually an agent's fast response was correct. And I won't have time to discuss that task because there's competing hypotheses to explain, but I'll just say now that the results for that task are more ambiguous, and I'd love to hear people's thoughts on it offline if anyone is interested. So in the main task for experiment two, we essentially had the same design as in experiment one. Participants saw agents see a map and heard them start their engines after either 20 seconds or three seconds, again with three trials at each agency. But this time in the main task, we asked participants whether the person had actually figured out the answer or whether they'd made a mistake. And again, this was on a four point scale from definitely made a mistake to definitely figured it out. So for the main results, we again tested 45 kids ages five to seven, and another 45 ages eight to 10, and 45 adults. And on this y-axis, uh, a four this time means definitely figured it out, and a one this time means definitely made a mistake. And I'm again plotting fast responses in green and slow responses in blue. Now, even 20 seconds is still really too fast to solve puzzles like this. So we didn't make a strong prediction about whether people would actually differ from chance on whether the 20 second responses were accurate. What we did predict is that people would think that the 20 second responses were more likely to be accurate than the three second responses. And we predicted that even the youngest kids would recognize that these maps are too difficult to solve in three seconds. And what we found was that older children and adults thought that the fast answers were wrong and thought that slow answers were more likely to be right than fast answers, as we predicted. Now, adults were also more likely to, than chance to say that slow answers were correct, though older kids didn't differ from chance for slow answers. And younger kids were significantly less skeptical than both older children and adults. They didn't think that fast answers, excuse me, they did think that fast answers were uh, more likely wrong at rates greater than chance, but the difference between um, fast and slow answers wasn't actually significant. So children's responses here are weaker than we expected, particularly given that in the second task in experiment one, even the six-year-olds overwhelmingly believed that the fast responser was cheating. And that suggested to us that they thought that three seconds really was too fast to solve these puzzles. So we think that in experiment two, the problem may have been methodological and we're exploring some of these possibilities further. But again, the, children's fast or, um, the, the children did think that fast responses were um, more likely than chance to be wrong. So the first experiment gave us evidence that children can use response time to infer whether an agent was remembering something or figuring it out for the first time. And the second experiment provides evidence that children may be skeptical of fast responses to complex problems. And importantly, this is a skepticism that is about as generally applicable as it can be. Children never solve the solutions to any of these puzzles themselves, none of these children would have been able to solve these puzzles on their own, 
And even if they did see a solution, a child wouldn't be able to verify whether it was actually the shortest road. Instead, the time the agent spent thinking was enough to tell its kids what the agent's solution was worth. We're running experiments now looking more closely at the kinds of inferences children can make on the basis of response time, and we think these inferences could help children orient their exploration decisions and decide how to learn from others. So an informant that produces information very quickly might be worth questioning more. Alternatively, an informant who spent a lot of time um, thinking about a solution, um, if they did that, it might be worth thinking further about that solution yourself. And tracking response latency might also help children decide how trustworthy an informant is in a conversation, even when they don't have content-specific knowledge. So that's all. Thanks for your attention.